We welcome you to this Good Friday worship. We pray that the Lord blesses us as we worship him this night. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Fellow redeemed, there were many people watching our Lord as he finished the course he was determined to follow. His eyes set on the cross before him. Few of the onlookers could understand what was happening, but none of them dissuaded him from doing his Father's will for us. When a woman anointed him with precious oil, the disciples complained. Why was the ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. Jesus said, She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. When Jesus announced that one of the twelve would betray him, they said to him, Is it I? He said to them, The Son of Man goes as it is written of him. When he told the disciples to watch and pray, they fell asleep and did not know what to answer him. But he said, It is enough. The hour has come. When he said that they would all fall away, Peter said to him, Even though they all fall away, I will not. Jesus said to him, Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. When the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Jesus said, I am. When Pilate asked him, Are you the King of the Jews? Jesus answered him, You have said so. When Jesus and the disciples were eating the Passover meal, he revealed to them, This is my body. This is my blood of the covenant. And when he was on the cross, and the leaders mocked him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Today let us fix our eyes on the cross and realize with the centurion that truly this man was the Son of God. Behold, the life-giving cross on which was hung the salvation of the whole world. O come, let us worship him. Behold, the life-giving cross on which was hung the salvation of the whole world. O come, let us worship him. Behold, the life-giving cross on which was hung the salvation of the whole world. O come, let us worship him. Together we sing.
as we find ourselves this evening at the foot of the cross, there's no mistaking the weight of our sin, the impact of our words and actions. There's no arguing whether or not we have truly followed God's will with our lives. There's no excusing the things that we have left undone. We come before our Lord now in silent confession. What's clear on this otherwise dark day is God's unfailing mercy for his children. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I pronounce to you the forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, so strengthen our faith this day that we may fix our eyes on Jesus, ignore the views of this fallen world, and see with clarity your love for us and all mankind. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Isaiah writes about how people saw our Lord during his passion, how his Father viewed the sacrifice and the love which was in our Savior's eyes. The Old Testament reading is from the 52nd and 53rd chapters of Isaiah. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, His appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them, they see. And that which they have not heard, they understand. Who has believed they heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that is before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and for his generation who considered that he was cut off 
out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercessions for the transgressors. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I think I heard him say when he was struggling up the hill I think I heard him say take my mother
The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 15th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry Jesus' cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them, to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from that cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders, hearing it, said, Behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he had breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. O sacred head, Let me never, never out 
heart live my love for thee. Be thou my consolation, my shield when I must die. Remind me of thy passion when my last hour draws nigh. Mine eyes shall then behold thee, upon thy cross shall dwell. My heart, my faith, enfold thee, who dieth thus dies well. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, our Lord and Savior, who is Jesus Christ. Amen. The lack of answers is frustrating. Not knowing unsettles our soul. It keeps us all a little bit on edge. I would love to be able to tell my children that I know when life will go back to normal, that I, that I know, have an idea even, what that day will look like. You see, the truth is that we believe knowledge gives us back a little control, and so we absolutely hate not knowing. One of the more helpful articles I've read in the past week appeared in Time magazine. It was written by N.T. Wright, uh, a phenomenal theologian. Wright talks about uh, the danger of God's faithful offering answers when we really don't know. He says there are segments of the Christian community who want to explain this virus and why this virus has happened, what God is doing in this moment a group that will uh, try to name the sins associated with this plague, to explain how certain people have roused the anger of God in this viral menace. And as we've also heard on the news, there are also uh, pockets of Christianity that believe God will exempt all the faithful from the suffering that's going on. And so, without regard uh, to what the authorities say, they continue uh, mass gatherings. Wright says Christians have to try to give answers to questions. Wright says that Christians who try to give answers to questions about what is going on are too often misguided. Instead, he encourages us to remember the biblical practice of lamenting. Lamenting is calling out to God, just calling out to Him, sharing our frustrations, our fear, our anxiety, even our anger. Laments are recorded all throughout Scripture. There are laments like, why do you hide yourself in time of trouble? Why do you stand so far off? Relieve the troubles of my heart. Bring me out of this distress. You see, lament is not a failure of faith. When we lament, we're actually putting our faith into action. A faith that says, God is who we turn to in times of need. A faith that leans on our relationship with God as making a difference. And not only do laments remind us to be raw, to be transparent, to be authentic when we call out to God, but Scripture shows us that our God is a lamenting God. We get it in the book of Genesis as we see God mourn the depravity of the human race. We see the interchange as Abraham negotiates with God, trying to delay his wrath against Sodom and Gomorrah. We can feel God's frustration with the obstinate and unlearning Israelites. We witness Jesus crying just outside Lazarus' tomb. And then we turn to the cross. 
And at the cross, where we gather tonight, we see our suffering Savior. He has been brought before all types of officials these last couple days. They have interrogated him, attacked him, and mocked him. He allows himself to be their pawn. He is tried for crimes he never committed. He offers no defense. He has been beaten and whipped without mercy, bludgeoned to appease this bloodthirsty crowd. He gives no response. He is nailed to a wooden cross and hoisted into the air. And now begins the most frustrating, unsettling time in the history of our world. We all just stand there staring at him, looking for answers. Will this be the moment of God's great power on display? Will a messenger swoop down from heaven and take him away? Will the ground all around him blaze with fire hot enough to burn up this hill? Or will he be found out to be a fake, as a fraud, as something so much less than everybody had hoped for? Darkness sets in all around, and hours pass. And then he cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In so doing, Jesus is echoing the psalmist's lament recorded first in the 22nd Psalm. A psalm of David that seems to envision the suffering of our Savior now hundreds of years before this moment. God, how could you let this happen? Most questions will not be fully answered for a few days. And yet as the sky goes black in the middle of the day, Jesus cries out and he breathes his last and the ground quakes. The massive temple curtain is torn in two from top all the way to the bottom, and a Roman guard who is stationed beside the cross, a most unusual gospel messenger, confesses to the world, truly this man was the Son of God. It's unsettling to not know what God is up to. It's frustrating to have to wait on answers. But on this dark Friday, that the faithful have come to regard as good, we learn where to turn in these moments. We turn our eyes to the cross, the cross where our Savior has died, and we cry out to God, knowing that He will answer us. On this frustrating, unsettling Friday, we are reminded of the certainty that Sunday is coming. Amen. We share together a common confession of our faith as found in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We continue now with our offering 
as we uh, think about our giving and our generosity in this community and our faithfulness in giving to the church, we know this. Anything short of truly sacrificial giving does not represent the Savior we claim to be ours. The Savior who has given his life for the world. And so with that, the response of the faithful is to give sacrificially so that Christ may be exalted in all that we do. We continue now with the prayers of the church. Let us pray. Let us pray for the whole church that our Lord God would defend her against the assaults and temptations of the adversary and keep her perpetually on the true foundation that is Jesus Christ. Almighty and everlasting God, since you have revealed your glory to all nations in Christ and in the word of his truth, keep, we ask you, in safety the works of your mercy so that your church church spread throughout all the nations may be defended against the adversary and may serve you in true faith and persevere in the confession of your name through Jesus Christ our Lord. O almighty, everlasting God, through your only Son, our blessed Lord, You have commanded us to love our enemies, to do good to those who hate us, to pray for those who persecute us. We therefore earnestly implore you that by your gracious visitation all our enemies may be led to true repentance and may have the same love and be of one accord and one mind and heart with us and with your whole Christian church. Dear Father, we commit your precious church back to you this day that in this suffering hour your church may make its presence known. Dear God, We lift up to you those among us who we know are hurting and struggling and in need of your healing hand on their lives. We pray for Mike. Lord, we lift him up to you. Father, we pray for Roger and Sue, for Bruce and Helen, for Alice, for Ellie, for Audrey, for Ruth Ann, for Norm and Joanne, for Kathy, and for Sue, for Lisa. Lord, we call out to you now with the names of those who are on our heart. Dear God, we call out to you. You know our fears, you know our hurts, you know our pain. Lord, if we could fix these things on our own, we would. But we can't. So in desperation, in frustration, we cry out to you. Dear God, hear our prayer. Heal our land. Fuel your church. Hear us as we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Together we pray the prayer that our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Together we sing. Passion of our Lord, according to St. John, the 18th and 19th chapters. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You also are not one of the man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter was also with them, standing and warming himself. We sing together. Sometimes it 
it causes me to tremble, tremble. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself, so they said to him, you also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not one of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you at the garden with him? Peter again denied it, and at once the rooster crowed. Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. So Pilate went outside to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? And they answered him, If this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourself and judge him by your own law. And the Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken, to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord? Or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from this world. And Pilate said to him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world. To bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate said to him, What is truth? Together we sing. After Pilate had said this, 
He went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him, and the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! And Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he has made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement and in Aramaic, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold, your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him. Crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. Together we sing. Stricken, smitten, and afflicted, see him dying on the tree. Tis the Christ by men rejected, yes, my soul, tis he, tis he. Tis the long-expected prophet, David's son, yet David's Lord. Proofs I see sufficient of it, tis the true and faithful word. So they took Jesus, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription, and he put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place was where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but rather, this man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written.
the words of the prophets, as they were adapted for this day centuries ago, portray God's abject sadness and dismay as he looked down on his son on the cross. Thus says the Lord, What have I done to you, O my people, and wherein have I offended you? Answer me, for I have raised you up out of prison, the house of sin and death, and you have delivered up your Redeemer to be scourged. For I have redeemed you from the house of bondage, and you have nailed your Savior to the cross, O my people. Holy Lord God, holy and mighty God, holy and most merciful Redeemer, God eternal, leave us not to bitter death. O Lord, have mercy. Thus says the Lord, What have I done to you, O my people, and wherein have I offended you? Answer me, for I have conquered all your foes, and you have given me over and delivered me to those who persecute me. For I have fed you with my word and refreshed you with living water, and you have given me gall and vinegar to drink, O my people. Holy Lord God, Holy and mighty God, holy and most merciful Redeemer, God eternal, allow us not to lose hope in the face of death and hell. O Lord, have mercy. Thus says the Lord, What have I done to you, O my people, and wherein have I offended you? Answer me. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? My people, is this how you thank your God? Oh, my people. Holy Lord God, holy and mighty God, holy and most merciful Redeemer, God eternal, keep us steadfast in the true faith. Oh, Lord, have mercy. And the soldiers had crucified Jesus. They took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciples whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Together we sing. O perfect life of love, all, all is finished now. All that he left his throne above to do for us be. For 
Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth that you also may believe. For these things took place, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again another scripture says, They will look on him whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, Ask Pilate that he may take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and he took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus. They bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as with the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Let us pray. Almighty God, graciously behold this, your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and delivered in the hands of sinful men to suffer death upon the cross. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.